This is a 1977 Austin Allegro. It is possibly the worst car ever made by British Leyland and it's mine and I'm going to convert it to run on batteries. This car has done 67,000 Ks or 167,000 Ks. If you look at the online register, the Ks go all over the place. So it looks like there was a misreading at some point. It's actually only done 67,000 Ks. A couple of common misconceptions about these cars is that they rusted out a lot and that they were really unreliable. They actually didn't rust as bad as most cars at the time. One thing that British Leyland got right about this car was rust prevention. However, unreliability, well, it was about the same as any other British Leyland car. It wasn't better or worse than the others. This car, like so many other British Leyland cars, shared a whole wealth of parts. The only downside is that this, in 1977, was supposedly, people say, the worst time to ever buy a British Leyland car, because that was when all the strikes were going on between management and the workers. No work ever got done. Cars were sent off the production line unfinished. People actually who worked on the production line said, let the dealers sort it out. We're done. If, even if it's, it's missing part of the engine or missing part of the suspension, don't worry, it'll get sent back on a recall. Our job's done. That was basically the quality of British Leyland cars that was being produced in the 1970s, the late 70s. And this is one of them. <laughs> so by converting it to electric, I'm only doing it a favor. If you've only just joined this saga, then there's a bit of a backstory. I love electric cars, always been infatuated with them. I did an electric car conversion back in 2007 with an old Mitsubishi Tredia, brought the thing home, ripped out the engine, attached an electric motor to the car's gearbox, dropped it in, then dropped in a bunch of batteries and some cabling. This was back when lead acid batteries were the main battery to use. And I got it fired up and wired up and uh, drove around New Plymouth for a couple of years before it died of rust. And then I moved to Slovakia and ended up, because electric car conversions aren't really legal there, unless you're an auto manufacturer, it's illegal to convert a car to electric in Slovakia, I ended up buying a factory-made one, drove it around, had all kinds of adventures, even took it to Ukraine and back. I think I was the first person in Slovakia to ever go from Austria to Ukraine and back right across the Slovak Republic. That was an epic adventure. And then I sold that when I left Slovakia. I moved to the USA. I lived in Florida for two and a half years. And I bought a Lada Neva, which I'd planned to convert to electric. Because in Florida, you don't need any special documentation or rules. You just convert the car. You do what you want to your car. You don't even have to tell the DMV. You don't have to do anything. It's brilliant. Uh, so I bought a Lada Neva in pretty good condition. I bought it in Seattle on the other end of the country, drove it all the way across the United States, all the way down through California, across the desert, had an epic time. What an adventure that was. If you want to check out that video, it's on my channel. You won't regret it, but it is like 55 minutes long and I go through a bunch of states. Uh, I did have some mechanical issues with the car. It broke down a couple of times, but they were just temporary breakdowns. Uh, the car just got in a bad mood, although it did have a massive fuel leak. It was dropping fuel everywhere. Man, what a drama that was. I did eventually get the thing home to Florida, and then I started measuring out the engine bay to see how easy it would be to put a Nissan Leaf motor into the Lada Neva. And I'd bought some parts and things were going pretty good. I was all in the planning stage, but then my ex called it quits, so I returned home to New Zealand where I am now. Now, I have this, I'm gonna convert it, and no evil spouses can stop it from happening. Yes! So I hope you join me on this epic adventure. Many people though ask why this car? Well, the reason is, in all honesty, it's because I wanted a car that people wouldn't moan about by ruining the pedigree. Even that Lada Neva, which has been the butt of jokes for decades, I got so many emails and letters telling me, don't you dare convert that car, it's too perfect, you'll ruin the prestige. Yeah, I know, madness. Um, but so when I got this car, I thought, well, surely an Austin Allegro, no one is going to worry about converting this piece of crap to electric. <laughs> I was wrong. I got messages from people saying that, well, they're okay with the idea of electric cars, but they're not happy with what I'm doing. <laughs> really? You're not happy with something I'm doing that doesn't affect you in any way whatsoever? I don't understand that mentality of internet gatekeeping or telling others what they can and can't do with their property when it doesn't affect them in any way at all. I just don't understand it. Uh, but here we are. So I thought surely this car, the Austin Allegro, would be safe from the purists. Turns out it's not, but I'm gonna do it anyway. So if that's you and you're unhappy with what I'm doing, where were you when this car sat for sale for months? Why didn't you buy it to protect it? You're all talk, aren't you? A lot of people have also complained that surely this car's in too good a nick to convert to electric. It's too pristine, it's pure, it's like a museum piece. Well, it's not. It's got dents. That's body filler. Had some repair done here, hopefully not rust. Honestly, it's in good condition for its age, but it has been in the wars. 
And what the heck is going on here? And look at that overspray. Oh, neat crazy cracks as well. Cool. The carpet's also ruined. And look at the cracks on the dashboard. It's falling apart. And don't get me started on the controls that don't work. Okay, but I'm sure despite all this, the petrol heads watching this are going, hey, but why an electric car conversion? Well, because I like electric cars. I have used to be a hardcore petrol head. I've owned 28 cars in my life. But it wasn't until I discovered electric cars that I just lost my interest in my former passion. I, I now, I just want electric. Electric's better. And if you've driven electric cars, like properly driven them, you'll know what I'm talking about. They're faster, they're more responsive. The accelerator is like binary. It is raw power. It is brilliant. It's so efficient. It's, it's just, it's everything you could want. It's just perfect. And that's what I want in this thing. Electric cars are just better. My four requirements for an electric car conversion are number one, it has to turn heads and mission accomplished. Even now running on petrofuels, this ugly duckling turns a lot of heads, cool. Number two, it has to be quick and responsive and zip off the mark. And with an 80 kilowatt Nissan Leaf drivetrain, it will achieve that. Because right now its engine does 43 kilowatts and it struggles a bit. But with 80 kilowatts, this thing will leap off the mark. Number three is it has to cost less than taking the bus. That's electric propulsion for you. Electric cars cost nothing to run. And number four, it has to do 100 k's per charge at least. Okay, that's where things get difficult. That's where we need to do some planning. I've got some technical issues to overcome during this conversion. This is the stuff that keeps me awake at night. So weight limit is the obvious problem with batteries. So with a full petrol tank, this Austin Allegro weighs 862 kilograms. Now the maximum weight that this vehicle can handle, including people and luggage, is 1,184 kilograms. So that only leaves 322 kilos for people and luggage. That's not a lot and batteries are heavy. Now I have done some calculations, however, and once I remove this, the planet killer, plus the gearbox and the exhaust pipe and the gas tank and all that stuff, I should shave about 230 kilograms off the car. So at this point, the car is weighing around 630 kilos, right? I had to write this stuff down because I'm an idiot. The Nissan Leaf drivetrain is about 90 kilograms. So if you add another 30 kilos for EV related cabling and components and stuff, and if I got a 16 kilowatt hour battery pack, this is just theoretical at this point, capable of around 130 Ks per charge, maybe, uh, at around 150 kilograms, that means the total weight would be 900 kilos. Now that puts it only about 40 kilos over the standard weight, which seems too good to be true. If it is true though, it is bloody brilliant news because it means it won't strain the unusual hydrogas suspension system. And let me tell you about the hydrogas system. It is out of this world. It's a, a really quite an ingenious idea. How it works is that the front wheels and the back wheels are interconnected by a hydraulic pipe. And what happens when the front wheel hits a bump, it transfers pressure through that pipe to the back wheel to raise. And then it hits a nitrogen chamber to absorb the heaviest, heaviest impact. So what it means is that the car glides along, the back wheel goes up at the same time as the front wheel and, and same on the other side, so that it absolutely glides over the bump. It is like, remember waterbeds back in the 80s? Imagine a waterbed with wheels. That's what this thing feels like. This hydrogas system is like nothing else and I want to keep it in the car because it's like floating on a cloud and sure, like this stolen footage demonstrates, it can handle terrible roads really well, but where it shines is on the highway. Seriously, even though it's a small car, when driving on the open road or motorway, it feels like it's a three-ton Cadillac. It's hard to explain, but seeing as I want to keep the entire car as factory standard as possible, including the unusual springless nitrogen and fluid suspension system, it means I've got to be careful that I don't overload it with battery weight. But there are other issues to solve first. Another issue I've got though is if I'm going to be using a Nissan Leaf motor, inverter, and DC to DC converter and all that sort of stuff, it's quite a tall stack. I've measured it, it will just fit in because this is quite a tall engine. So that's the good news. The bad news is I'll be getting rid of the British Leyland gearbox, which means I'm gonna use the Nissan Leaf reduction box, which means I need drive shafts built, brand new drive shafts, and that is gonna cost a bit of money, as I found out. The good news is, is that only about a kilometer away from my house, or where I'm staying, anyway, it's not my house, is, a drive shaft fabricator. I'm just got to remember where they are. <laughs> drive shaft New Zealand. This looks like me. Okay, good news is it's doable. Uh, the bad news is we're looking at about $700 per shaft. So, Say 1500 bucks to get new drive shafts put in. 
So yeah, gotta keep saving. All right, another problem I've got to fix is to sort out the heater when it's running on electric power. Right now, the heater is a bit of a mess. British Leyland weren't known for their quality heaters. The heater doesn't actually blow hot air on the top of the windscreen and I can't figure it out. The previous owner doesn't know why it's happening either. Uh, I've checked the linkages underneath here. One of the cables did pop off, so I fixed that, but that didn't actually solve the problem. It's still blowing only cold air on the top. And it's a requirement by New Zealand law, when I get this car certified under electric power, it must have a heater. That's logical, you've got to defrost, defrost the windscreen. So what I thought about doing is something a little bit weird. Instead of using, say, a Nissan LEAF water heater, which was my original plan, which would use electricity to heat water in the system to use the existing heater core to somehow blow hot air on the windscreen, I'm gonna go with something really, really basic. Now you might remember that back in Slovakia, I bought a diesel heater for my electric car and I rigged that up in the back and it worked reasonably well. It actually warmed the car up quite nicely. Now, obviously I'm not gonna buy another diesel heater because that would be madness given what we know about the climate. The other option I thought about using was maybe tapping into the high voltage battery pack and running a high voltage electric heater under the dashboard. Well, you're not allowed to bring in high voltage cables into the passenger compartment according to New Zealand law when converting an electric car. But I do have another alternative. The alternator on this car puts out about 40 amps maximum. The DC to DC converter puts out about 140 amps, 12 volts, which means that I could run a series of 12 volt heaters under the dashboard and all have them tapped into the 12 volt system. I could run more than a kilowatt, <laughs> I wouldn't, but I could run more than a kilowatts worth of 12 volt heaters. So that's that problem solved. It's low voltage, the car can handle it, and it'll certainly work. It just means taking the dashboard apart and sorting that out. And I can't do that until the conversion begins. Another problem I have to solve, now these are all fixable problems by the way, it's not just me complaining, these are fixable, is the speedometer. It runs on a speedo cable which spins, which is connected to the gearbox. However, when the gearbox is gone, the speedo won't turn, and obviously I have to have a speedo, but I've come up with a solution. There's a company in the USA which sells these devices that plug in to your existing speedo cable and they run off a GPS signal. So as soon as you start moving, this device starts spinning. You can calibrate it to be identical, to, to match with your speed. So it's all legit. And is that loose? No? Yes? Okay. Oh, British Leyland. Okay. <laughs> you can calibrate it so that it'll work with your speedo and that's that problem solved. And in theory, I might even be able to install it behind the dashboard so there's no more cable showing because I do want a tidy conversion. Now I haven't figured out all the details, but, and ignore the carpet, the car did actually come with brand new underlay and brand new carpet, which I've yet to install. But I think there's enough room for a 16 kilowatt hour battery pack, I think. I might split it up between the front and the rear, but basically, Putting in the electric motor, getting the drive shafts created, and finding places for the batteries, those are the three biggest things, and they're all overcomable. Is overcomable a word? Well, they're all solvable problems. The only thing that's not easily solvable is where do I do the conversion and how do I pay for it? <laughs> so yeah, there are some money problems to overcome, but it's only money, we'll get there. I reckon the conversion is probably gonna cost about 15 grand. Now I am putting about 100 bucks a week into a separate account, so I am slowly building up the money, but it is gonna take some time. So money's one problem, we'll overcome that. The next problem, however, is where to do the conversion. Where I am right now with my folks, there is just no room in the house, and I'm not gonna show you the garage out of respect to them, but there is no room. Not even room for a Nissan Leaf motor to sit in the corner, there is no corner. It is floor to ceiling, shelving, tables, furniture, car parts, project, art, furniture, more furniture. And I'm sort of a no clutter person. I like a minimalist lifestyle. So having to twist and turn to walk through a room past furniture, it's sort of doing my head in. So I will get my own place, <laughs> not only to do this conversion, but also for my own sanity. Uh, and that's probably gonna take a few more months yet. I have seen a mortgage specialist. Uh, this is gonna be part of the adventure is me getting my own place. Uh, but my budget dictates that it's gonna be a one bedroom shack about 37 hours south of Auckland. So <laughs> yeah, watch this space. But all these problems, technical, financial, they're all overcomable. That should be a word. If it isn't, overcomable needs to be a word. So stick around. It's gonna be one heck of an adventure. It's gonna be a lot of fun. It's gonna take some time though. So be patient. But, uh, but do stay tuned, because I'm excited. I think about doing this conversion, I'm not kidding, about 30 times a day. I think about it 
all the time. In meetings, when I'm supposed to be paying attention, I'm nodding, but I'm thinking about the conversion. I hope my boss isn't watching this. Yeah, it's gonna happen. Be patient. Your days are numbered, cancer pipe.